goes, just do it. Do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Just, just do it. They go, <clears throat> this is CNN. When I did that, wow. that threw him off. You might be the best dressed man in wrestling, or at least the best dressed man here at uh, Major League Pro Wrestling. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Uh, to be the, the world champion, you got to lead by example, and this is no different. Yeah, so you walk in the doors at Major League Wrestling, people know you're the guy. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I do stand out to some degree. It's funny uh, that uh, every interview I've ever watched with you, all the comments are about your voice. Like, how often do people, like, when, when they don't know what you do for a living, what do they think that you do? That, that's a good question. They're, they're usually thrown off at the, the level of my voice and my cadence, the way that I do speak. So they can't tell where I'm from. I don't sound like I'm from New York because I don't carry the regional accent. Yeah. But uh, I've had a variety of things. You should be in radio. You should be a phone sex operator. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's been a wide spectrum of suggestions. Remember that guy, the man with the golden voice, the homeless man who, the, yes, yeah, yes. your voice sounds just like his. <laughs> well, thank you. I don't think I can sing the way he can, though. You should, maybe you should do some voiceover work on the side. I do. Uh, yeah? I've done voiceover work on the side in the past. I was the lead character voice for the TNA video game in 2006 and uh, done a few spots for local radio in, uh, in Tampa. And uh, it's, it's something that I've been, it's been suggested to me for, for a very long time, even going as far back as uh, me being a teenager, when my voice first began changing and I wasn't necessarily as uh, physically uh, developed as I am now. I feel like uh, you could be like the, this is CNN, like that guy. <laughs> oh, that guy? Could you say it for us? <clears throat> yeah. This is something that a, a buddy of mine would not let me live down. So one day we're sitting on my sofa, we're watching some TV, and we're flipping through, and that came on. He goes, bro, that's you. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, just do it. Do it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Just, just do it. He goes, <clears throat> this is CNN. When I did that, wow. that threw him off because he's like, I told you, I told you, you should be doing this. And I'm like, all right, all right. Then we started messing around with that Lion King because these are all James Earl Jones yeah. uh, positions or, or roles. And uh, so when he said the Lion King, the first thing that came to mind was Simba, everything the light touches is our kingdom. <laughs> so it's just the, the inflection of going up and down the way James Earl Jones does, yeah. but it's having that delivery of that power, that presence behind yeah. it. So it's stuff I played with here and there. I've interviewed Morgan Freeman before, and your voice is actually more powerful than his in person. Oh, well, that's a very uh, uh, overwhelming compliment, so thank and you. And it's true, it is. <laughs> so, you know, obviously you've got the voice stuff that you could, you know, touch on maybe later on in your career. Yeah. You've just celebrated 20 years in the ring, isn't that right? Yes, sir. This is my 20th year in professional wrestling as a licensed professional. Uh, because in the, in the past, you had to have a, a structure before you became a professional. It wasn't just, hey, I'm here, put me on a show, because that seems to be what's common now. In the past, you had to get sponsored by or graduate from a school. Then you had to go to the athletic commission, which then had to put you to, through their version of testing in order to qualify you to be licensed as a professional. I had to go through that back then. It's no this is in New York? Before. This was in New York yeah. City. It's no longer the same, and it's no longer the same for every state in the United States because they're different, different rules for different states. So I take pride in that because that was the original structure of entering this as a profession, not as, oh, this is just something to do, which a lot of people intend. That's their attitude towards it. No, this is a profession. You can treat it well and actually get a good return off of it if it's done properly. Would you say that TNA was really what put you on the map in a global scale? Uh, I don't think so. I think they put me more on the map on a, a domestic scale okay. here in the United States because they were my first big introduction to national television on a regular basis. I had done, at the same time, I had done dark matches for the WWF at the time. So I was getting dual exposure on a national scale at that time. TNA was more consistent because I spent the most time there. So it's just on and off since 2002 until 2017. I had a long history with that company, so they had me more on a national domestic scale. 
my experience is where I wanted to gain in Japan, that took me more on the world scale because that changed my style to where it was much more ferocious and much more sport oriented and fight oriented, which earns more respect than just being an entertainer. You were in the very first TNA match ever, which I think is crazy to think where TNA is now. What did it mean for you to step on that stage? To step on that stage at that time, which was June 19, 2002, it was unique because I was unfamiliar with that type of atmosphere. This is the first introduction I have to a majority of those people that were there at that time. So I'd never met them before. I'd never been around them before. Plus now I'm looking at my competition. Me being who I am and where I come from, I don't know these people. I'm smaller than most of them, if not all of them. So in order for me to stand out, I got to show everybody who I am. So that's me coming out and being ferocious and being uh, probably the most aggressive out of everyone, but it's because I have to compensate for my lack of size and my lack of presence otherwise. Do you, does it bother you? Because you're one of the names, when people think of TNA, it's you and it's Joe and it's AJ and a couple of other guys. Yeah. Does it bother you that you never held the world championship there? Uh, no, it doesn't bother me because I've seen the quality of the champions that they've had. Um, my time was coming last year. And when the issue with Del Rio came up and they dissolved my, my opportunity, to me that showed me they had no invested interest in me to begin with. So not to have that world championship, it's, it's not anything off of my back. My career is way greater than one belt. Yeah. And your career has taken off a lot since your time in WWE. In fact, you could argue that leaving WWE was probably the best thing to happen to you. Well, it was the most healthy option. It's a toxic environment. I don't know how it is now because I haven't been there and I don't watch, so I, don't, I can't offer an opinion on that. But at least for me, it was a toxic environment that served no further purpose, so it was best for me to go. And because of that, I was able to thrive in other areas and with other opportunities, but these are the opportunities that they had available to them and they chose not to use them. Do you not watch wrestling at all or you just don't watch WWE? I occasionally watch other stuff. WWE, I have no interest in. Um, and it's just because it's very difficult to sit through it. And I'm a fan of skill. I'm a fan of stuff that's intriguing. I'm a fan of stuff that's cleverly done. There's thought behind it. Yeah. A lot of the times it's like a conveyor belt of the same stuff. And that's difficult to do because there's so many people who are, who are wanting to, to enjoy this, but it takes them away if it becomes a repetitive pattern that they can recognize and it takes away their ability to have fun. And again, I'm not knocking them because I don't watch their product. I don't know enough to comment on them. But from the feedback that I get from other people, what we're doing is much more interesting than others, but it's because it seems like we're offering something that the others aren't. And the way that I see it is traditional values. It's very simple values, but we're not insulting the intelligence of our people. We're letting our work do the talking for us in that ring. People say there's a real distinction between WWE wrestling and the rest. Would you say that's pretty fair? I think it's fair, but you also have to take into consideration it's an entertainment company. And that's the, that's the discrepancy between pro wrestling and sports entertainment. Sports entertainment is hiring pro wrestlers to do entertaining things. So that's not pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is competition. Pro wrestling is Carl Gotch. Pro wrestling is, is uh, 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 Jumbo Saruta. Pro wrestling is Shinya Hashimoto, Kenta Kobashi, Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody. This is pro wrestling. What you guys are seeing today is not pro wrestling. Even Ring of Honor, that's not pro wrestling. These are guys of a lower experience level trying to be entertaining. That's not pro wrestling. Pro wrestling is competition. So that's the reason why there's a distinction between legendary pro wrestlers and then entertainers. With that said, do you like what Ring of Honor is doing right now? Uh, again, I don't, I'm not as familiar with their stuff, so it, wouldn't be un, it would be unfair for me to comment. At least from what I'm aware of, you can't really knock them because they're going into Madison Square Garden. Yeah. They're going into Madison Square Garden in a working, promo, a working agreement with New Japan Pro Wrestling, so their business is growing. These are opportunities that weren't available in the past. So at least with that respect, that's something cool. That's something good for them. So I mean, if that's, the, that's how they're evolving their business, cool. I'm a traditionalist. My job is in the ring, not outside the ring. Yeah. So if they can't deliver in the ring, 
then you know something's going on here that needs to be corrected. When you come to a promotion like MLW, do you basically say, here's what I have to offer and let's work around that? How much creative control do you have? Uh, I've been given a lot of creative freedom, but I take it with respect that I'm working with other people here. And there is a direction that is has been developed and in order for it to be executed and delivered, there's certain things that need to be done. My experience allows me to see all of that in advance, but I rarely talk anyway, I'm just listening because I'm listening to learn about what's going on and how to put everything together. And I think because of that, we have a good chemistry here in MLW. When you were about to sign on and be part of NXT, was there any part of you that was like, I'm not sure if this is the right move for me. I don't know if I want to go there. Yeah, that was my initial instinct because when I was called, they didn't tell me that it was happening other than watch TV tonight. And uh, when they put it on, my first instinct was, are you serious? Because I was on the phone with uh, John Laurinaitis and he's asking me like what I thought and I just passed it off like, eh, it's all right. You know, because at that time I had just spent 10 and a half months on the sidelines after blowing out my ACL in FCW. So I just wasted 10 and a half months of my life after already spending over 10, you know, professionally conquering everything I've done around the world. Yeah. And then now this is your introduction to the to the world. Yeah. But again, I've said this in other interviews. Most places that you go to, the people in charge should not be in charge. They're not leaders. They want to be bosses, fine. You can recognize a boss. A leader, on the other hand, knows what he's doing. And I know what I'm doing. I've known it for a long time because I was taught properly. And it has nothing to do with me. I just put in that effort to keep it going. My teachers are responsible for that. But I recognize those things in advance like, all right, I see where this is going. Let me try to do the best with it that I can, and that's what I tried to do. I just feel it's a timing thing, though, because I was familiar with your work before, and I feel like if, if they were bringing in low-key into WWE today for the first time ever, you'd get a very different reception, and they would treat it very differently yeah. than they did back then. I think that would be the case, but that's an evolution. they got to learn from their mistakes. And, I mean, I don't knock them for it. The same management is in place. So, I mean, I wonder why it's the same story with other people. And I don't have to repeat any of that stuff, but think about it. The people who leave, how many of them speak positively about their experience there? Yeah. So yeah. that you know that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with what exists there. So with that respect, you know, I don't I don't worry about anything else other than what I can show up and bring them to the table. And I've been consistent. I've been consistent since day one, but that's because I had good teachers and I put in the work that's necessary to do this at a high level. Speaking of being a teacher, I saw you recently doing, or you do a lot of seminars. I saw you recently, I think, at Gangrel's school, right? Yes, uh, what's the advice that you give to these up-and-coming wrestlers? Learn how to compete. Most of them don't know how to because they're getting in the ring thinking that, oh, this is what I see on Monday nights. Okay, then what happens when you run into somebody who has a background, a competitive background? I wrestled Freddie Ahai last night. He's an amateur wrestler. That's a strong boy. He's a farm, he has that farm strength. Yeah. And I felt it. And I know the difference because I've trained with a lot of different people. I've trained with Olympians. I've trained with FBI agents. I've trained with military and law enforcement. I've trained with a whole bunch of different people. So to have that reference, that frame of reference of difference in control and power, and Freddie's a, Freddie's a strong boy. What happens if you're inexperienced, but you want to posture and show everybody who you are and then run into somebody like Freddie who can control you, who can throw you around, turn you into a pretzel? It's the old method like with uh, uh, Danny Hodge and uh, you know all the Fujiwara, Akira Maeda, all these older guys that in today's world people would be concerned with, oh, they're rough. You know, all those are competitors. There's a difference. So I think that's the biggest issue with uh, uh, people entering pro wrestling today. But then that's also an issue that you see prevalent on television. If they don't know how to compete, they're playing. If they're playing, you're going to see it. Are you saying there's a distinction between being competitive and working stiff? Yes, because working stiff indicates that there's some lack of control. Being competitive, there's full control in there. But the thing is, you ever see uh, good jujitsu or good grappling? They're not hurting each other, but the technique is so high level, you marvel at the stuff that they're doing. Yeah. And if they decide to actually go in and try to hurt each other, it can happen rather easily. 
What's the difference? Is there someone on your list that you wish you could have worked with that maybe isn't working anymore? Or maybe someone that still is working that you go, hopefully I'll get a chance to work with them one day. I had one more on my list, but he passed away, and it was Chris Benoit. My goal, I used to have a list of the people that I admire in pro wrestling on my website. I used to have that. And I was chopping away at that list, either at people that I had worked with, worked against, or at least grown to know. And Benoit was one of the last remaining on that list that I would have had an opportunity. Um, but it's because I was the first match for Eddie Guerrero when he got released from WWE. And the match that I had with him, I understood psychologically I needed him in the proper mind frame, but physically he needed to enjoy himself again. So that match that I had with him was directed at him to let him know like, hey, this is pro wrestling, not that bullshit you just came from. Yeah. So when I went out and had that match with him, it impressed him so much that he spoke about me in his first book. And when he did that, I had a chance to wrestle with him a second time. So I can't remember where, I think it was Atlantic Championship Wrestling. And uh, I had to wrestle another wrestler named Xavier from New York first and, and defeat him in order to get the match with Eddie Guerrero that night. And after we had that match, that night with Eddie, he was there with, uh, with Hector Guerrero. And when we were in the locker room, he goes, I like you because I could wrestle you like Dean and Chris. Wow. So to me, it was the respect shown to the commitment made to what I'm doing. I'm not here to play games, but neither were the legends. So if you want to be in that company, you got to cut through all the bullshit and get rid of all this nonsense and focus because this can be done really well. And in the company that I was in, I'm all around legends. And these guys, they treated me like an equal, but the only way that, the only way that came about was because they saw how hard I was working. I earned their respect. I wasn't out getting drunk. I wasn't out getting pilled up. I wasn't out getting DUIs. I wasn't out beating women. I wasn't out doing all the negative stuff that seems to draw attention and then for some reason gets rewarded. I wasn't doing any of that. I kept it simple, just like the Olympians do it. This is my life. I'm training for my life. I'm going in for the kill when that bell rings. What are you going to do? Simple. You've been in the ring for 20 years. You're the current champion now. It doesn't seem like you're slowing down at all. <laughs> so what is, you know, if we do look 5, 10, 20 years ahead, what's your eye on then? The eye on the future for me right now is, one, enjoy every moment. It's something I hadn't done, but that's the requirement of deep focus. In order for you to achieve a high degree of success, you do have to focus extremely hard, but it does stop your interaction with a lot of other things in life. And I negated a lot of that coming up, but it served a particular purpose. Now, it's not to the same capacity as, that, as it once was, so I get a chance to enjoy it a little more than I once had. And because of that, this is a new generation. I'm surrounded by new, a new generation of people who think, but even a new generation of people who are actually skilled at what they do. And now we all get to work in the same environment. So this is fun because now it's not us dragging ourselves into work. It's, man, I can't wait to get there. Yeah. So that's a different feeling. So like I said, just enjoying every moment. And you look like you're having fun out there. Well, I hope so. I know everyone, they, they have their, not everyone, but a lot of people have their opinions about what they see and they form these, uh, these opinions and they know nothing of me. But, you know, the one thing you will, you will see is how much I love what I do according to what's going on in there. Such a t uh, great time talking to you. Pleasure, Thank you so much. Thanks look forward to seeing you in the ring tonight. <laughs> well, I look forward to getting there. It's going to be a big one because we got the, we got El Jefe coming out of retirement, so it should be quite interesting today. All right, awesome. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Again, man. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, making the choice to tune in to one of my videos and, well, for continuing to watch until the end. What a voice to listen to for the last 18 minutes, right? I mean, while his voice is very deep and very relaxing to listen to, uh, it's also interesting how particular he is with his words. He doesn't say words like, um, or like, which you and I, I'm sure, are guilty of. And in those particular word choices, his thoughts on WWE and their, uh, quote, conveyor belt of product is very interesting to hear. 
Uh, also interesting to hear about his thoughts leaving TNA and where he's at now with MLW, who has a great product, by the way. Um, if you can't find it on BN Sports, which is the network that they're on, uh, check them out online. They've got some really great stuff, and uh, I think that we're going to be talking a lot about them in 2019. And since this is 2019, this is the first video of 2019, uh, we're going to do it big this year. My goal is to put out 50 wrestling interviews this year, which is a lofty goal. It's like one a week, and I'm not exactly your traditional YouTuber who says, every Tuesday I upload a new video. Actually, it'd be more like, hey guys, what's going on? Every Tuesday I'm going to upload a new video for you. Uh, and no disrespect to those guys. They're awesome. It's just, you know, that's not what I'm able to do. I, I do the interviews that I'm given access to through either wrestling companies that come here to town. I'm in South Florida or the, when the WWE actually says yes and allows me to do an interview, which leads me into some uh, pretty big news for 2019. I've uh, partnered up with a little company called Cricket Wireless, and I've also partnered up with a little company, a little wrestling promotion called the WWE. And I'm going to be doing interviews at WrestleMania, the Royal Rumble, SummerSlam, and Survivor Series. I don't know who I'm going to be interviewing, but uh, please leave a comment below and let me know who you'd like to hear me do an interview with. I can tell you who I'd like to do interviews with. I'd like to do interviews with AJ Styles, Triple H. I'd like to do an interview with Vince McMahon. Kevin Owens would be a good interview. Well, there's there's about... A, there, so basically everyone on the roster I'd like to interview. Um, but that will be happening soon. It'll be happening at the Royal Rumble. And you'll be seeing that stuff on my channel and also on some other channels as well. Um, 2018 was an incredible year. I hit 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. All thanks to you. I can't thank you enough for that. So 2018, we're going to do it even bigger. Maybe we can get 100,000 subscribers this year. Probably not, but who knows? Uh, so thanks for tuning in. As always, the awesome shirts you see me wearing in the interviews, like this one here, collar and elbow. The link is below to uh, get a good deal on those. I got three cool interviews at MLW. Uh, Brian Pillman, who's right here. Teddy Hart, who's right here. And the low-key interview who you just watched. Uh, we got some more coming up, including the next one. The next one is Y2J. Woo! Should be good. Make it a great year, guys.